UNIFEM was established in 1976 and who is advocating women's rights and gender equality. And now we have, most recently, the UN Security Council resolutions, I mentioned 3025 of year 2000, and last year's 1820 on sexual violence in conflict. They are crucial, ref crucial references for all work on gender and women's rights. I would say that if you do not pay attention to gender in peacekeeping missions, in conflict situations, war situations, and you try to change the situation, if you don't pay attention to gender, that means you only pay attention to 50% of the population. It's that easy. And paying attention to gender aspects of women's needs give a head start to reconstruction development, or research shows that. And often in places of conflict, <coughs> where the men are all where fighting, it is the women who keep the societies going. And function. And paying attention to gender gives us more sustainable so solutions to the problems that caused the conflict in the first place. And there is evidence to suggest that the more unequal societies are in, ter are in terms of gender, the more prone they are to conflict. And there is also a well-documented connection between gender equality and poverty reduction as well. And uh, it is important that peacekeeping missions and visiting visitors to peacekeeping missions from the Security Council, for instance, that they also actively engage with women's organizations when they can go to mission, which is not always the case. They have no time for that. My view is that, based upon my experience, is that we have failed in protecting women, girls, and young boys, I would add, from conflict-related sexual violence in the UN. And, of course, the fault is the cause of the member states. All have failed. But we can do something about it. We can do much better if the political will and moral courage, if they are mobilized. And I agree with what a former military commander, the force commander, said now in Eastern Congo, DRC. He said, it is more dangerous to be a woman than to be a soldier. And we can see the failure if we look at the Balkan War, Balkan Wars, despite the fact that mass rape of women was used as a weapon of war in the 90s in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the de gender dimension of the conflict, the different impact the conflict caused on women and men and on society at large, was not at all taken into account into the final peace settlement. So the shortcomings of the Dayton peace accords at the time were serious missed opportunities to redress the gender inequalities and ensure sustainable human development. And today, we see that sexual-based gender, gender-based violence, such as mass rape during armed conflict, is recognized as a weapon of war and a security threat in this new resolution 1820 from last year, and in the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court. And yet, although it has been 14 years since the Dayton Accord was signed, the same shortcomings can be found in later peace agreements over and over again, neglecting the role of women. We have now thus two important resolutions. And the first one was 1325, which you could say is more is about power and protection. A resolution 1325 is so important because it says that women must be involved in all stages of the peace process. They should not be seen only as victims, but also as actors, and important actors. Now, with, 13, with 1820, last year's resolution of the Security Council, you add on protection, but also punishment. You say that crimes committed against women in conflict, like rape and other forms of conflict-related sexual violence, should be seen as, I put it, a weapon of mass destruction, as a war crime, as the text says, and a crime against humanity. And the new US draft resolution, which will be voted on next week, 
and that when Hillary Clinton will come to the Security Council, to the Security Council to introduce it, uh, will, while President Obama will preside over the session on nuclear disarmament, not a big thing, uh, shows that we finally have, we finally have, to my mind, having followed this for years, uh, the role of women seen as victims and very little as uh, actors in conflict. We finally have a critical mass where we can get action through the Security Council resolution, which will fight impunity and thus act as prevention and deterrence also, and which will responsibilize the force commanders, the leaders of militia groups, of guerrilla groups, and of government troops for crimes committed by their soldiers. This is the first time. To give it more teeth, I will say, in the coming resolution on the new peacekeeping mission, which always involves the possibility of use of force under Chapter 7, you should write in also as a security threat sexual based violence, because this would be in line with Resolution 1820. All this would enhance the protection, participation, and empowerment of women which in turn will contribute to sustainable peace. But above all, and here I quote Cora Weiss, who has been here talking about peace and women, as long as women are not at all tables and in significant numbers in decision-making positions to influence and initiate legislation rape and, on rape and other forms with sexual violence will continue with impunity, as long as women are not at all tables. Here it is important, and we experienced this, not least Morgan yesterday when she presented her views at the UN, we are not talking about Western imposed values by the West. These values concern human rights, they are women rights, rights of young girls and boys, but men also, and they are not negotiable. They are accepted by, endorsed by the UN, Security Council, General Assembly, and also, if you so wish, by the African Union in this charter. And they are not negotiable because it is, in the end, it's what kind of society we want to live in and what we want to see our kids live up in. So, final words. What can you do about this sad situation or state of affairs in the world? Well, first of all, there are many organizations you can join. You can join the UNI family. Men and women can do that, boys and girls. Amnesty and the United Nations Association will say another advocacy group. Many of them are here, President of Canvas, I know. And you remember I mentioned CEDAW, the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Discrimination Against Women? Well, the United States is one of the very few countries that have not yet signed that document. Do you think? that the U.S. can credibly demand that other governments abide by the treaty commitments as long as you refuse to ratify CEDAW yourselves? You can help strengthen America's voice in support of human rights and women's equality by calling your senators today and tell them to ratify that agreement. So, we all have a role to play. You have a role to play, also in this matter. See President Obama in the White House. There was another guy there when I was here at that outfit last time. <laughs> Brings back the memory to me of a great American poet, Langston Hughes, who in 1938 wrote in his book, poetry book, uh, New Song, I think it was called, the poem, the magnificent poem, Let America Be America Again. I will just quote a few stanzas. I am the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. Then further on, oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be the land where every man is free. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me, and yet I swear this oath America will be.